Hello and welcome uh, everyone to our session today. I am François Nicolas, Chief Digital Officer at Gearbay, and it's a real pleasure for me to chair this session today, which is entitled Challenges and Pitfalls of Current Clinical Practice. Where will augmented intelligence bring value? So we have a very interesting session for you and are fortunate to be, to be joined by Dr. Parizel and Dr. Hippolito. Uh, we'll have mm. a couple pre-recorded presentations and uh, I really encourage you to um, submit your, your questions, some of that will be addressed during the session, uh, during the, the presentations and others will be addressed live um, during the live Q&A. So it's now my pleasure to uh, commence this session by handing over to Dr. Parizel for a presentation on the neuroimaging chapter. Dr. Parizel is a full professor at the University of Western Australia. He holds an appointment as the David Hartley Chair of Radiology, Royal Perth Hospital and University of Western Australia. He serves as the Director of Western Australian National Imaging Facility, and he chairs the Clinical Radiology Research Committee of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Radiology. He is also the past president and chairman of the board of directors of the ESR and ECR. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paisel. Good morning, good afternoon, or good day. Depends on where you are, but it is a pleasure to welcome you from Perth, Western Australia. And I would like to share with you some beautiful images from the city that I now call home. It is indeed a privilege and an honor to be part of this Gay Bay Symposium, Challenges and Pitfalls of Current cl Clinical Practice, Where Will Augmented Intelligence Bring Value? And my topic today is going to be neuroimaging. I do have some disclosures to make. I'm uh, a member uh, of the board and the medical advisory board and a shareholder in some uh, companies and you can see them listed here. And I am an invited speaker for Gebe. This is the outline of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, there will be seven topics. Um, I will try to be brief and stick to the time. And we're going to start with the first topic that I have called, now you see it, now you don't, detecting the invisible. Now, artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence can help radiologists to detect uh, findings that are invisible or almost invisible to the naked eye, such as in patients with acute stroke, finding subtle differences in CT density, which are almost invisible to the human eye. And here is an example of the original data and then a processed scan. We can use that information also to uh, assess and automatically calculate the aspect score, which is very valuable for clinical decision-making and patient management. We um, are able to uh, perform automated CT perfusion studies that can identify appropriate candidates for thrombectomy. Uh, we can do the same thing with angiography data sets and assess the collateral circulation. And we know that the presence or absence of collaterals is a very important uh, determinant of outcome for patients. My second point is looking for a needle in a haystack detecting the visible. Now, you may ask why would we need augmented intelligence to um, help us find what is visible? Well, the comparison I would like to make is to finding a needle in a haystack. And there's a children game that is called Where's Waldo, where uh, children are invited to find this funny character with a red and white striped, striped jersey in a drawing that contains hundreds of small figures. And those of you who are true radiologists have immediately recognized that Waldo is hiding in the uh, right superior corner of this drawing. Now, in radiology, it is not just one image that we look at, but we are looking at a whole collection of images, a stack of images, for example, CT, and every image of that stack may contain a potential wardrobe. 
We do that in different imaging planes, axial, sagittal, coronal, using different imaging contrasts, using new gimmicks like uh, perfusion, arterial phase, venous phase, what have you. So it's a very big challenge for radiologists to find and identify the information that is important. Help is on the way, and we know that, for example, pigeons can be trained to detect breast cancer. And this is not a joke. This is actually from a high-impact journal where pigeons were trained to observe pathology and radiology breast cancer images by identifying abnormal cells or abnormal areas, or rather areas of abnormal density within the breast tissue, as you can see here. This is the challenge that we are facing. And at the University of Antwerp, where I have been chair for 16 years, we had software that helped us identify hemorrhage within the cranial vault. Here are four different images from four different patients. And you can see very subtle uh, high density abnormalities indicated on the lower images by the um, yellow chevron and indicating um, what, wh where the hemorrhage is located. That information is injected into the PACS system. And in this case, for example, you may see a very small right frontal extra axial hemorrhage. And the big uh, advantage is that you, of course, see that uh, there is a very short time from um, scanning the patient to finalizing the case, as you can see here on this image. Here's another example from the same software vendor, uh, IDOC, AIDOC, uh, where we see a non-displaced fracture of a transverse process within the uh, cervical spine. And again, this augments the workflow of radiologists by giving priority to those images where the software uh, suspects there could be an abnormality. So again, why do we need software to detect invisible lesions? Well, because we are uh, confronted with a tsunami of examinations and images. Um, we see that because many of our colleagues are using CT, for example, as an extension of the physical examination of the patient. Sometimes the indications are poor, clinical examinations are incomplete, and this generates large numbers of unnecessary examinations and images. Technical innovations in CT technique especially and enhanced diagnostic capabilities have led to massive data sets. We um, are not more radiologists now than we were 10 years ago, and yet our workload has increased tremendously. And um, we uh, are in dire need of uh, augmented intelligence to process data. This is uh, a number of a data set of a patient who came in through the emergency room in whom 11,723 images were generated. Um, different body organs, brain, um, uh, head and neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, spine, using CT angiography, reformats in multiple planes, soft tissue windows, bone windows, volume rendering, etc. So there were 35 different series of images in one patient, over 11,000 images to look at. That is a lot. My third point is, hello, my name is, and that is all about characterization. Characterization um, can help us to actually identify the type of a lesion and the type of a tumor. And here is an example of a patient with a tumor in the fourth ventricle, central in the posterior fossa. We can segment out that image, make a 3D reconstruction, uh, do a volume rendering, and then release a software program on it that will recognize the pattern segment of the mass lesion and help to characterize the brain tumor. And if we are lucky, that software will give us a name tag saying, hello, my name is meduloblastoma. This software is being used already in China, was developed in um, the biggest neurological, neurosurgical hospital in China and all of Asia, the Tiantan Hospital, uh, National Clinical Research Center of Neurological Diseases. 
and they have been training the system by comparing images of tumors with 50,000 annotated and pathologically verified ground truth image data sets of patients with brain tumors. And this uh, has led to an atlas where typical manifestations of certain tumors are stored and um, any new tumor is compared to that atlas and would greatly help um, uh, radiologists to make correct diagnosis. This uh, system has been tried in a public event that took place um, more than a year ago in Beijing. And I wrote an editorial about this, which I called I've Seen the Future, a competition between physicians and AI. And I can tell you that the artificial intelligence uh, performed better than a team of selected neurologists and neuroradiologists in identifying tumors, especially rare tumors. My fourth point is to measure and is to know qualification and monitoring. Qualification is based on a technique which is called segmentation, and it is possible to segment out CSF, gray matter, white matter, and whole brain on 3D volumetric data sets. If we do that in a patient with multiple sclerosis, we could segment out the white matter lesions to look for new inflammatory foci, and we could segment out the gray matter to look for atrophy. We feed the images into a computer and the output reveals the white matter lesions in blue and the gray matter in green. And we can very accurately assess the volume of the brain that is involved by this disease and the volume loss by the atrophic component. This is how it works. Um, the, there is a side-by-side -side comparison of the um, lesions. The lesions are automatically outlined, segmented, and we can generate a 3D volumetric map of the lesion load in the brain in this patient with multiple sclerosis, generating an automated quantifiable report that separates pre-existing lesions from new lesions and lesions that are actually enlarging. And the way this report um, is presented to the radiologist is this way. Uh, where we have bar charts indicating the volume of uh, the lesions on a current scan compared to the previous scan, compared to the previous, previous scan. And we do that in the four anatomic regions that are defined by the McDonald criteria, namely periventricular, juxtacortical, infratentorial, and deep white matter. My next point is making the wheels go round workflow integration. And that is probably where augmented intelligence is going to make the biggest impact. I already mentioned to you that the use of software to automatically recognize hem hemorrhage in the brain um, can also help to uh, prioritize um, large uh, data and prioritize those exams that warrant immediate attention. And um, so we have two elements in augmented intelligence. There is reading assistance. So the software helps the radiologist to be a better reader and not to miss any lesions. And then at the same time, there is work list assistant, assistance that actually helps the radiologist to give priority to those patients or those study where an abnormality is seen by the software. And of course, we live in the 21st century, so all of that information can be shared with colleagues via um, computer, uh, tablet, or smartphone, social media, what have you. Um, this is probably the biggest revolution going on in augmented intelligence. In clinical practice, it means that in patients with suspected intracranial hemorrhage, the report turnaround time can be decreased the length of stay in the emergency department can be decreased and the um, length of stay in hospital can be decreased by as much as a quarter of a day. And these are very, very significant changes that translate in a lot of money saved for the hospital. Same in patients with um, a diagnosis of intracerebral hemorrhage, it is known that software can help us to identify 4.2% of intracranial hemorrhage patients that were overlooked previously and that can now be flagged with the aid of artificial intelligence. And the same holds true for
or pulmonary emboli. My sixth point is, are we living the end of radiology as we know it or not? Well, I think it's time to get real and to understand that in my lifetime, in my professional lifetime, I have seen a dramatic change in our profession. In this composite image, you see eight different types of radiological examinations that I had to learn while I was um, a young registrar or a resident, whatever you like to call it. And all of these studies today are no longer performed because they have been, um, uh, because they have been replaced by newer techniques such as uh, ultrasound, CT, MR, uh, angio, and what have you. So radiology is in a constant state of evolution and augmented intelligence, artificial intelligence, is just another phase in this evolution. It is not going to replace the radiologist, but um, it is widely believed that it will replace those radiologists who do not use AI by radiologists who are computer savvy and those who are using augmented intelligence. My final point is the future is so bright you gotta wear shades or maybe not. Well, augmented intelligence increases accuracy and efficiency of neuroradiologists by detecting subtle changes that are invisible to the human eye, by processing huge data sets, by allowing us to characterize rare brain tumors, and by comparing individual images against thousands of um, histo histologically proven records of patients with brain tumors, by quantifying abnormalities such as the lesions in multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury, atrophy of the hippocampus, measuring is a very important element in artificial intelligence. Helping to monitor disease evolution and assessing response to treatment, unraveling relationships in population studies. In neuroradiology, currently there is already a vast array of diseases in which augmented intelligence can be used, ranging from MS over dementia, stroke, brain trauma, Parkinson, depression, tumors, many others. And we see that this field is exploding with new applications every couple of weeks. There are still a few more clouds in the sky, and this is because we need to check and verify the results. Uh, imperfect segmentations uh, may lead to erroneous conclusions. Tremendous amounts of annotated medical imaging are needed to train um, the system and increase the power of deep learning. Integration of augmented intelligence into clinical workflow routines is essential. We need turnkey solutions. And finally, the field needs rigorous controlled studies. What is my take home message? Well, I think in building the case for augmented intelligence, we should start by observing that there is an ever increasing workload in imaging and a shortage of neuroradiologists. Augmented intelligence offers enhanced productivity, increases diagnostic accuracy and lowers the rate of misdiagnosis, can decrease the length of stay in the emergency department and in hospital admissions. And this is an important element to convince administrators that they need to invest in this. It can save time and money. And finally, it can potentially improve patient outcomes. Once again, thank you for the invitation to be here. I greet you from Royal Perth Hospital in Perth, Western Australia. Thank you very much for your attention. Attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Parizel, for that extremely uh, interesting, educational, and inspiring presentation. Um, please, um, attendees uh, on the audience, uh, don't hesitate to submit your, your questions. Uh, we will address them in the live Q&A, as I mentioned. And now it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ippolito, uh, with his presentation on the liver imaging chapter. Um, Dr. Ippolito is Director of Emergency Radiology Unit at the St. 
uh, Gerardo Hospital Center, which is one of the high national relevance on specialty center in Italy. His practice on clinical interest are on hepatobiliary and oncologic imaging, with a special focus on advanced application for CT, MRI, PET, angiogenesis imaging uh, with CT on MR, as well as imaging assessment response of new treatment uh, methods in cancer. Uh, Dr. Ippolito is an adjunct professor of radiology at University of Milano, Bisoka, and he's responsible of research on residence project on teaching, teacher at many scientific meetings on courses on abdominal radiology, on advanced application on CT, MR, and genetics imaging. He's an ESGAR fellow and member of the ESGAR committee. So I'm very happy to um, have uh, Dr. Ippolito now present for the liver imaging chapter again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the kind presentation and welcome everybody to this webinar dedicated to the application of artificial intelligence in liver imaging. First of all, I would like to thank Gerbe for uh, the kind invitation as a speaker for this event and for the support. Well, let's start with the definition of artificial intelligence. The artificial intelligence is the intelligence applied by machine in contrast to the natural intelligence displayed by humans. And in the radiological world, it is a branch of computer science that deal with the acquisition, with the reconstruction, with the analysis, and with the interpretation of medical images by simulating the human intelligent behavior in computers. But unfortunately, the artificial intelligence is really unspecific terms because it includes in itself several other concepts like the deep learning, the machine learning, the quantitative assessment, or the neural network. Moreover, in liver imaging, we have a wide range of application of the different subcategories of artificial intelligence. And in the last 10 years, a really high amount of publication have been published all, all over the world. And by using several different techniques in the radiological domain. But on the other hand, from a clinical point of view, a really few amount of radiologists are used or used in clinical practice the artificial intelligence and which are the reason of increasing in AI demanding and clinical practice. Maybe it derives from the fact that the radiological imaging data continues to grow with very significant high rate, and at the same time, we are assisting to the declining in imaging reimbursement. This approach has forced the healthcare providers to compensate it with increasing productivity and this factor have contributed to a dramatic increase in radiological workloads. On this basis, the artificial intelligence should be integrated into the clinical workflow, having as main aim to assist the physician. In which way? First, the artificial intelligence within the imaging workflow should increase the efficiency of radiologists because it allows to reduce the errors. Moreover, the artificial intelligence, we know that excel in recognizing some complex pattern in imaging data and can provide at once a quantitative assessment in automated fashion. Finally, the artificial intelligence should help us in some time during the repetitive task, especially in follow-up study, avoiding so the really time-consuming procedures. But which could be the possible field of application of artificial intelligence in liver imaging. We can recognize first the liver detection, liver characterization, and monitoring of liver disease. Regarding the detection, it means the possibility to detect any potential abnormalities within liver images on the basis of changes in attenuation or in intensities, or the appearance of unusual pattern within liver images. Therefore, we should consider the detection and artificial intelligence like as an automated CAD system that allows us to recognize each different focal liver lesion and measure it. And only later, the radiologist will be able to decide whether a certain automated annotation needs further investigation or not. 
And again, in the last years, the deep learning algorithm combined with multiple imaging modalities have been widely used in the detection of focal liver lesion or in the assessment of diffuse liver alteration. And this recent paper, this recent review, highlights the very high diagnostic accuracy of different deep learning systems combined with CT or with ultrasound in detecting several liver alterations, like the fat involvement, the cirrhotic liver alteration, or the presence of neoplastic liver alteration. But some challenges and some limitations should be overcome because the AI algorithm should be able to recognize each different focal liver lesion, avoiding to consider a large area of the disease. And this approach is really important, especially in the follow-up of patients with oncologic disease. Moreover, the algorithm should be able to distinguish the real focal liver lesion from lesion who do not. And to do this, the algorithm should be able to combine the information that derived from the several contrastographic phase in the different technique with CT or with MRI. But let's move to the characterization. The characterization is a really unspecific term because it refers in itself to uh, several concepts, such as the segmentation, the diagnosis, or the staging. And regarding the segmentation of the liver parenchyma or the segmentation of liver vasculatures, we know that is really important for the referring clinician, clinician both with CT or with MR, because allowed to plan the several possible approach, the surgical planning, the radiotherapy planning, or the liver transplantation planning. Therefore, a software that allow us to immediately recognize the lesion, that allow us to assess the relationship between lesion and several vascular structures, allow us to recognize the liver segment and quantify the overall liver volume is really important. Moreover, we should not forget that the manual segmentation is a really time-consuming process and could be prone to human error. Therefore, the uh, segmentation artificial intelligence could be really useful, especially in pick up the, the repetitive routine task because can support radiologists by performing the automatic measurement, which are currently very time consuming. Like in this example of patient with the liver polycystosis, we know that it's really important to recognize it, each different cystic liver alteration and to measure it. And it's really important also to follow up the lesion along of the time and to assess the overall amount of alteration to quantify it is a really time-consuming procedure. But an automated software and artificial intelligence may allow us also to quantify the total amount in terms of volume of liver cyst involvement and evaluate the possible evaluation evolution along of the time. Moreover, another really interesting field of interest regarding the artificial intelligence and segmentation is the primary sclerosing cholangitis. This is an autoimmune disease characterized by the presence of several biliary tree structures associated with biliary tree dilation. And from clinical point of view, we know that it is really difficult to assess the modification along of the time or the response to treatment only by using the visual analysis. Therefore, a software that in automated fashion can immediately quantify the biliary tree anatomy and that can offer us in a quantitative way the total amount of biliary strictures, the total amount of biliary dilation, the total amount of biliary tree volume and blood volume is highly desirable and really important to determine the response to treatment during the several and possible follow-up. And the last part of characterization, diagnosis and staging. We know that the radiological diagnosis of potentially malignant hepatic lesion remains a challenging task. And in the last years in this setting, the standardized images analysis and reporting system has been introduced in clinical practice, also called the LIRADS, that 
have as a main aim to improve the radiological diagnosis by reducing the imaging interpretation of variability and on the other hand to improve the communication with referring physician. But again, unfortunately, the increasing complexity of LIRAD has made its implementation less feasible in a, a high volume practice. But a recent paper published on European radiologists in 2019 demonstrated the high diagnostic value and diagnostic accuracy of deep learning system in categorizing the different focal fever lesion according to the different LIRAD category. So the software was able to distinguish the benign lesion from hepatocellular carcinoma and distinguish the non-hepatocellular carcinoma malignant lesion with very high diagnostic accuracy in a faster way if compared with human performance. And the software was able also to categorize independently each different focal lesion, like the cyst, the hemangioma, the FNH, and the hepatocellular carcinoma. But unfortunately, in this paper, some limitation should be highlighted, uh, like, and the most important one is that the only lesion with typical imaging features on MRI were used, excluding so the lesion with more ambiguous features or with poor image quality. Moreover, we do not forget that the LIRADs can be applied only in patients with cirrhotic uh, liver alteration and not with normal liver disease. But this performance metric suggests that the deep learning system could serve as a quick and reliable second opinion for radiologists in the diagnosis of hepatic lesion, helping to reduce the interpretation difficulty and the inter-reader variability. But again, also in this case, some issues must be addressed because we know that in the different radiologic place and each different radiologist are used to apply the different acquisition protocol, both with CT and with MR. But if we want to uh, take an advantage from the artificial intelligence, we have to standardize our acquisition protocols in order that to work correctly in the different hospital and the different centers. But let's move to the disease monitoring. The disease monitoring is essential for the diagnosis as well as for evaluation of treatment response. Because even if some change characteristics can be directly recognizable by humans, such as the modification in object size, developing of shape or cavitation, other alteration or the subtle variation in texture and heterogeneity cannot be so simple, recognizable by human eyes. Moreover, when we work in the liver imaging, we know that there exist several liver evaluation criteria, mainly based on tumor size, also called RESIST 1.1 or WHO, but we have further uh, evaluation criteria dedicated to hepatocellular carcinoma in which we have to recognize the viable portion of tumor and the necrotic portion by using the contrast enhancement. And again, the application of artificial intelligence could be really useful to monitor the effect of therapy. And in this case, we need different software dedicated to solid tumor or to hepatocellular carcinoma. But what we could expect from the future in uh, liver artificial intelligence. We'll be able to ask to our workstation or to our supporting device, which is the final diagnosis, A, Siri, Alexa, and so on. I don't think so, because we have to overcome some limitation, because in tomography imaging, both with CT and MRI, we do not forget that the reconstruction algorithm controls the properties of the images more than the object does. And we theoretically, we should use the same acquisition protocol in each different centers, and the models of imaging system should be the same in each different center again. Moreover, at all of the time, we should check the quality, avoiding any possible noise or breath-related artifacts. It means, finally, that we theoretically should work with state-of-the-art technology, implying an increasing of investment in radiological work. 
Moreover, the artificial intelligence, differently from human behavior, usually excel in only one specific task. And we have to consider that open questions remain regarding the ambiguity of who is in control of AI and who is the ultimate responsible for his action. Therefore, before to decide to apply the artificial intelligence and clinical practice in our department, we need to determine which specific radiological tasks are most important for us and will benefit from deep learning algorithm, taking into account the strengths and the limitation of these algorithms and hospital need. But the artificial intelligence don't forget that running in the background can offer an easy way for obtaining a second opinion, and the algorithm results can serve as a simple backup check on the diagnosis of the physician. Moreover, it, the application of artificial intelligence allows the radiologist to gradually get used to working with AI. And moreover, really important, the application of artificial intelligence and in clinical practice will reduce the inter and intra observer variability because we know that even the best trained radiologist or the most experienced one may differ in the diagnosis sometimes. And we know that usually when we are well rested, we focus our attention in some specific features that can be different late in the morning or during the shift. Moreover, different radiologists might emphasize different aspects in their reports. Therefore, the artificial intelligence software has the ability to decrease or over eliminate this viability between the radiological reports. Well, to conclude, we can say that it is almost impossible for AI to replace the radiologist in the coming decades, but sure, radiologists that will use AI will replace radiologists who do not. And with the advancement of AI technology, the radiologist will achieve an increased accuracy with higher efficiency. And now I would like to thank you for that kind attention. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ippolito, for this extremely interesting and uh, educational presentation. Uh, thanks also everyone who asked a question in, in the chat uh, during the presentation. So we have gathered the questions. It's now my pleasure to put them to our speakers. Uh, so, so the first question will be for, for both of our speakers. Uh, what would you say is the single largest improvement that you expect from uh, AI machine learning that would add value to your field? So perhaps we can start with you, Professor Parizel, on the neuro side. I think on the neuro side, the, uh, the single largest improvement is what I would call quantification. And when we think about multiple sclerosis, um, we, there is software available, um, ICO Brain MS Metrics, uh, that will give you the exact volume of the lesions in a certain patient and compare that to the volume of the gray matter. And it is not, and I think Dr. Ippolito said it very well in his last slide, um, it will reduce the inter-observer variation and it will allow us to move from an art, you know, reading subtle signs into a science providing numbers. Uh, if you talk about the weather, what most radiologists do today is to say, ah, it is cold or it is warm, or it is really not so cold, but there is a lot of wind, yeah? Uh, if we use AI to measure, we can say today the temperature is 17.3 degrees. Thank you, it's, it's very, very interesting. Uh, Dr. Ippolito, on the, the neuro side for liver. I totally agree with uh, Professor Parizel because uh, the quantitative assessment of lesion uh, for us, especially in oncological world, is a really time-consuming procedure in everyday practice. So if we can offer in a fast way the measurement of lesion, the quantification, not only in oncological field, but also in um, some diffuse liver disease, like patients with primary sclerosis and cholangitis, this is one of the big issues in our clinical practice. We would to follow up the patient in the best way and determine if the disease remains stable over the time or 
uh, it have any possible modification. So again, the quantification is really important also from my point of view. Okay, that's very clear. So objective quantification on, the, on over time. Uh, a big um, question that's coming also is you both mentioned that um, radiologists who use AI will actually work better than on replace perhaps those radiologists that, that don't use AI. But the question is, could you explain what you think would be the practical function of the radiologist if all of the tasks we perform, so we as radiologists nowadays, would be fulfilled by AI? So what will be left, Dr. Professor Ippolito? Okay, first, we should not forget that we work for other clinicians. So we should offer precise uh, information and quick answer from our uh, report. Therefore, if we have a software that simplify this interaction with our colleague, uh, like the VIRADS, LIRADS, or PRADS, and we can offer this quantity, this number, or, uh, to the different uh, clinical physician, we can uh, increase the value of our work. Because sometimes our report is not so simple to understand what we are meaning, of, uh, which is the final diagnosis. Therefore, if the software allows us to offer quantitative information, final diagnosis, or specific value, we can uh, interact with a clinical physician in a better way, and our value significantly increase. So this is the meaning of the last sentence of my presentation. No, thank you. Thank you. And, and perhaps uh, Professor Parizel, uh, to complement, there's a connected question, which is, well, if AI allows to you know, help detect, measure, characterize lesions, is there a risk that actually the referring physician would um, embark and embrace this technology and there would be a reduced role for radiologists? What would be your perspective on that? Well, I think the, the, the question has come up multiple times about the future of radiology. Um, again, I would like, if you allow me, to make a short analogy. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, the first cars started to appear with a navigation system, a so-called GPS. Okay. And um, we are now 20 years later. Uh, the GPS has not replaced the driver. The GPS is a tool that helps the driver to avoid traffic jams, to find uh, his way or her way in a complex city. So I don't think there is much chance uh, of that. Uh, I think that um, in terms of artificial intelligence, um, clinicians for sure will use this if they find that they cannot get from us the answers. I again give the example of a patient with multiple sclerosis. The neurologist who refers the patient with multiple sclerosis and who gets back a report from a radiologist saying there are multiple white matter lesions in the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere, the brainstem, whatever, that is of no use to the neurologist because the neurologist knows already all that information. What the neurologist really wants to know is what is the evolution of the disease compared to the previous study? And that is the answer we should address. And that's exactly why we say that radiologists who refuse to understand uh, the evolution of the clinical sciences are going to be replaced by people uh, that, that know that, whether they are radiologists or clinicians. Okay, no, thank you very much. I think we have time for one last uh, quick question is, um, how many tools do you use in clinical practice uh, that you know of, of AI? And uh, do you think AI is ready for, for prime time? Perhaps Professor Parizel, on your own. Well, it is already ready for prime time. We are already using uh, in many in many hospitals, in many departments, we are using artificial intelligence. Uh, solutions. We are using equipment that has artificial intelligence built into it. Uh, so for sure, it is ready for prime time. I think the biggest challenge that we are facing is that with artificial intelligence, we are in a triangular relationship. There is radiology, there is the clinician who is often the greatest beneficiary of the information, and then there is the hospital administration, the ICT department, who would have to support the system. 
And I think that is something that radiologists must be very clear how to, how to clarify this triangle between radiology department, clinicians who are customers, and the IT department of the hospital who has to make it possible. No, no, thank you very much. Um, so with, with that, uh, I would like to um, thank uh, again uh, both our speakers. Uh, and um, I think it was a very interesting session. And um, thank you also for all the questions uh, that were raised by the attendees. Don't forget to um, evaluate this session online for people who uh, attended the session. So thanks again. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.